Good evening. I'm Ann Wells, the chair of the Filson Historical Society Board of Directors. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program. We're delighted to welcome back Karen Tumulty, Tumulty, I'll be right, a former Gertrude Pope Brown speaker and esteemed columnist and associate editor of the Washington Post. Karen Tumulty is an associate editor and columnist of the Washington Post. In her previous role as a national political correspondent for the newspaper, she received the Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting. She joined the Washington Post in 2010 from Time Magazine, where she had held the same title. During her more than 15 years at Time, Tumulty wrote or co-wrote more than three dozen cover stories. She also held positions with Time as congressional correspondent and White House correspondent. Before joining Time in 1994, Tumulty spent 14 years at the Los Angeles Times, where she covered a wide variety of beats. During her time there, she reported on Congress, business, energy, and economics from Los Angeles, New York, and DC. Tumulty is a native of San Antonio, where she began her career at the now defunct San Antonio Light. Tumulty holds a Bachelor of Journalism from the University of Texas at Austin and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Tonight's presentation will be moderated by Richard Clay, the president and CEO of the Filson Historical Society. There will be a short question and answer session at the conclusion of the program. If you are joining us virtually, please drop any questions you have in the chat and a Filson representative will share them as time permits. Please join me in welcoming back Karen Tumulty. Quick question um, for our staff. When we get to Q&A, where are the mics? Wonderful, thanks God. All right, well, what a treat to have you back. Oh, well, thank you so much for inviting me back. I so love Louisville and the Filson, although I'm a little intimidated to be following my dear friend, Frank Bruni, so. Uh... Uh, I think you can hold your own. <laughs> um, last year, you presented to us your wonderful biography, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. And um, I thought that it was penetrating on her as well as tangentially on her husband, President Reagan. And so I think I want to start out by asking you, what would Nancy think of this period in American political life? Boy, I, and what would Ronald Reagan think of this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that this is a kind of conservatism that neither of them would recognize as the conservatism that, that he stood for. Um, you know, it, it was so funny. I There's a new biography, a biopic, a movie about Reagan out. And so I decided to go see it over the weekend. And it's all about Reagan and the Soviet Union and, you know, everything he did to essentially crush it. And um, I was thinking, this is just so much the opposite of what we hear from the Republican Party these days. You know, they have nice things to say about Putin, who's trying to rebuild the Soviet Union. And you also see in the movie, you know, Ronald Reagan is really working with the international alliances. He's, you know, constantly talking to Margaret Thatcher and Helmut Kohl and, you know, Prime Minister Nakasone of July, of, of Japan. And it, this is just not, and, and, you know, also don't forget Ronald Reagan signed a huge, huge overhaul of the immigration laws yeah. that, um, you know, open, uh, legalized millions and millions of people who were living in the country illegally. Um, so, like I said, it just feels to me at least like this is not, you know, a party that he would necessarily recognize. I was about to ask you, well, would Nancy consult with her astrologer yes. <laughs> and have a prediction here? You know, she was always um, 
she was always cautious about people who wanted to sort of appropriate her husband for their purposes, um, especially as he was going into Alzheimer's and it really fell on her to protect the legacy. And there was one point in 1994, the Republicans had just taken over the House of Representatives and a group of them decide to put forward a bill that would have taken Franklin D. Roosevelt off the dime and put Ronald Reagan's profile on the dime. And Nancy Reagan stood up and said, my husband would not support this. My husband was a great admirer. My husband worshiped Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so I, I think, you know, I, I would not want to speak for her because I, you know, I don't know what she would think, but she did come out as pro-choice in 1994. Um, yeah, and did. so well, she didn't do it while her husband was in office, but, she, you know, she, she had her own, own thoughts. Why don't you, if you, if you don't mind, take us through what your role as a journalist has been during this campaign? Oh, sure. I am um, in 2018, I moved from the news side of the paper to the opinion side. So I write an op ed column. And really, but, you know, I, it, it's gotten to the point where so many journalists, especially on the opinion side, are in, you know, they're on this team or that team. And I really do try to get out as much as I can to sort of see things for myself and talk to people myself. So as a, for instance, um, in early July, right after Biden's disastrous debate, um, the lead of my column that night, I was in Atlanta, the lead of my column was get ready for the great democratic freak out. Um, but I thought, you know, I really ought to go see what Kamala Harris is like these days, because I had covered her 2019 campaign, which was a complete disaster. You know, she didn't even make it to Iowa. And so I traveled with her on Air Force Two to some events she was doing in New Orleans. And I was, among other things, horrified to discover there's no Wi-Fi on Air Force Two. Uh, Al Gore would be so shocked he invented the internet and this happens. Um, but I was really struck watching her in New Orleans, um, how much more self-confident she was, um, she, she had, you know, these three and a half years that she spent as vice president, she's, she's really developed quite a bit as a politician. I mean, if it's enough to get her over the finish line, I, I don't know, but um, she is a very different, she has a very different style. She is much more in 2019, she would just sort of blow which way the wind blew um, but she's just much more confident, much more sure of herself. So what I wrote is that, you know, she, that were she to run again, whether it's this year or four years from now, I wrote, she's going to be a lot harder to demonize and caricature than a lot of Republicans think she is. And I think she has, um, I think at least the early weeks of this campaign, she has shown that to be true. So what I, I guess you've now observed the staffs of the two candidates. What are they like? Um, Trump is fascinating because you look at the infrastructure of this this campaign, and it is just so much better and so much more professional than ever before. In 2016, until he got the nomination, it was just basically him, his campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, and his his aide, Hope Hicks, sort of living off the land. And then in 2020, it was really a bunch of grifters on that campaign. I mean, they basically had spent him out of money by the middle of the summer of 2020. But he has, in particular, two people running the campaign, Chris Lasavita and Susie Wiles, who are both pros and have have, until quite recently, um, had, it's been a much more disciplined campaign operation than Trump had ever had before. There's not much they can do about the candidate, but the, the campaign was, you know, and the way he sort of, they barreled him through the primaries was, was something to behold. Harris is sort of interesting. She's got the infrastructure that 
Biden had built in Wilmington. And one thing you see about these two campaigns is that the Biden campaign is much more built for a close race. It's got a lot of operation on the ground, offices. Um, it, it, Trump sort of can make his own weather on turnout. Um, so anyway, she gets that and she's brought in some of the smarter people from the Obama world. And as best I can tell, they're working well together. But, you know, when you're feeling like you have momentum, it's easier for people to get along. Um, but again, no, what nobody knows is what Trump is going to do at the end. And, and a good example of that is, and when I say he makes his own weather, in 2016, Hillary Clinton's campaign was pretty sure they were going to win Florida. Um, Obama had won it twice. Her numbers were looking pretty good. She had a lot of operation on the ground. And come election night, turnout was not at all what they thought it was going to be. And he blew her away in Florida. And so nobody really knows at this point. Right now, there's much more of an a Harris campaign apparatus on the ground. And again, let's remember this election is going to be decided in six or seven states and probably by 75,000 voters or fewer. Um, so, and the rest of us get to just spectate. Um, but right now it looks like she's got the better operation on the ground, but you, you just don't know with Trump what he can generate at the last minute. What, yeah, yeah. How are you reacting? What are you observing about uh, over these last months, the effect of the indictments, the trials, the verdicts, the convictions? Um, what do you see from those and how does that affect uh, the campaigns of both candidates? Well, the it was interesting at the Republican convention um, in Milwaukee. I mean, people were walking around in T-shirts that said, I'm voting for the felon. Um, so, and, you know, he turned his mugshot into a huge fundraising tool. But that said, I mean, you do get the sense that this is living in his head. Yeah. You know, the fact that if he doesn't win this race, it's not out of the question that he could end up in prison. And I do think that is, you know, sort of affecting him. Um, but his supporters are just convinced this is all sort of rigged against him, weaponizing the justice system. Um, you know, it's, in fact, it was that first indictment that ended the Republican primary effectively. You know, after that first, indictment, it was like everybody rallies around Trump and DeSantis, DeSantis is just out of it after that. So it's interesting. What how how do they look at that from the other side? Is is Harris walking a fine line uh in being too critical or not critical enough? Um what do you think? Well she really got in his head on it during the yeah. debate. Um and it's real it's really hard um as an opinion columnist to be sitting there on deadline because my editors are like expecting my copy at 11 o'clock. And I, I noticed that at the beginning of the debate, it was gonna be really hard to figure out where it was going because Trump did come out clearly with some kind of strategic plan in his head. Um, you know, she was whiffing some of her answers. She didn't have a good answer to, are you better off than you were four years ago? But the two things that happened, she went after him on the indictments and she went after him on his crowd sizes. And you could just watch him disintegrate at that moment. And all of a sudden he begins talking the way he talks at his rallies rather than the way one would expect somebody to talk on a debate stage. So all of a sudden we're hearing about Haitians eating cats and ducks and, um, you know, just, yeah. and, and it really, at that point, you know, it was pretty clear. She she knew where his soft spots were and she pushed all of them. Today, he announced that he was not going to do a third debate. Did because you... he says he won. That was, he says that was the best debate he ever did, so. 
do you believe that he'll stick to that or will there be a third debate? I don't think, no, I do not think there will be one. And the, the other thing that was telling on the night of the debate was that, so basically the press is all, we were six blocks away from the debate hall and you know, you've had literally 2000 reporters from all over the world sitting there filing their copy. And then they have this big area called the spin room. Trump has not set foot in the spin room since the primaries of 2016. And all of a sudden we look up and he's there. And that was when I knew he knew he had done badly and he wanted to come and rebut himself. Go, go for a minute and we'll wander a bit. And I want to assure everyone tonight, Karen has made it clear she wants a lot of audience questions. And so I'm not going to go on with Q&A as long as I usually do. And we'll, so be thinking of your questions now. Um, but what I'm, I'm wondering about is President Biden and where he is in all of this and the human effect that that debate took on him, uh, you know, I, did, I, did to him. I was thinking about that all night because, you know, he did resist leaving the race. And to see her go out and perform on a level that he just wasn't capable of doing, you know, that must have really, you know, it's it's sort of poignant. Um, sure. I mean, you can go back to why was he running for another term in the first place, but um, but all of this, I, I just just think of all the weird things that have happened just since June twenty seventh, the debate, and you know. How many weird things are going to happen again? And you do look at, you know, the polls don't tell you everything and there are problems with the polls and we'll stipulate all that. But there is a real consistency in the polls. And that is that this race really seems frozen. And um, you look at the six states that are going to matter. I was looking at an Emerson poll the other day, and in the six swing states, none of them have an undecided vote more than 3%. That is how small this little tiny sliver of the electorate is that both of them are running after. And, um, you know, you who are these people? Uh, and I can tell you what the Harris people, who they think they are. They say basically the undecided vote for them, they think, falls into four different categories. Number one is just people who are just, have been completely disengaged. Um, like, as I was checking into my hotel in Philadelphia, the desk clerk said, I didn't even know there was a debate. I mean, the debate is like a few blocks away. So there are a lot of people who just haven't checked into this election and may probably wouldn't show up on election day anyway. So, and that's predominantly male. Um, the second bucket that they talk about are people who have drifted over from the Democrats to Trump. And you see those numbers in Latino and black young men. Uh, you see it in some suburban women who say, you know, the economy just doesn't feel as good as it did. So there's, they're, they're trying to get those people back. The third bucket that they are looking at are people who would be voting Democratic, but they can't get them off the couch. Um, so it is sort of motivating people to actually show up. And then the fourth bucket is it's persuasion of people who are, you know, kind of moderate or kind of lean conservative who they think are gettable. And uh, you talk to the Trump people and, you know, they are convinced they're, you know, their base is going to be there for them, that, you know, they would crawl over ground glass to be there for Donald Trump. They claim they think they can get 20 percent of the black vote primarily young black men. They're doing surprisingly well among Latinos. Um, so, you know, there, there are fights over these different kinds of slices of the electorate, but, you know, I, I guess I believe the people, and let me tell you, the Harris people were not doing a lot of high fives after that debate. I mean, they just believe this is gonna be a 48-48 race right to the end. 
Um, what about the selection of the vice presidential candidates? And how critical are those selections with this, well, in general, but specifically with this group that both sides are trying to catch? You know, I don't know that the running mate matters a lot. We are going to have a debate. Well, maybe we'll have a debate between the two of them on, on October 1st. Um, I, I just don't think, and I also wonder if Trump had it to do over again, don't forget he selects J.D. Vance during the Republican convention. He has just been shot. And, you know, his team is thinking landslide. So he, with his gut and his son Don Jr.'s recommendations, picks somebody who just sort of amplifies who he is. Mm -hmm. um, it, Harris, it was very different. I was very surprised with Governor Walls. I mean, he doesn't sort of automatically bring you a state that you need. Uh, most people had never heard of him, but he does kind of expand her reach. You know, he's a white Midwestern guy who gives off dad vibes um and and so you can just see that these these two campaigns were thinking very very differently mm -hmm. i mean everybody i knew was convinced that it was going to be josh shapiro because he could have helped her presumably with pennsylvania i was actually um i was a big fan of mark kelly of arizona i just i wrote a whole column saying he would be the dream running mate and I assume that those two can help her even now in their respective states. Right. Big time. Um, what about the the platforms or lack thereof of the two uh, candidates? And you know, where where is the meat, the the yeah, where's the meat between the hamburger buns? There's none <laughs> okay. on either side. Um, because, you know, Kamala Harris it, it basically inherits the Biden record. And shes I do think she's going to have to be more specific than she has been on what she would do differently. It's really kind of hard to be running on the record of an administration where you've been for three and a half years and running as the agent of change and turning a new page. And she's... She has really resisted explaining that. And basically the Republican platform boils down to, you know, anything Trump wants. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was literally what their platform said in 2020. One last question from me, and then we will turn it over uh, to the audience. And that is this, um, this project 2025, um, is it for real? What is it? And is that really the platform or can we believe him when he says it's not? I He has resisted from the very beginning when this was coming up. Uh, he, it was a bunch of like guys from think tanks putting together what they thought the sort of ideal for a conservative president would be. But I, and yes, a lot of them had worked for Trump, but I really and truly believed the campaign when they were saying, this is not our platform. And the thing about Trump is he just makes stuff up on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, so I just can't imagine he's like sitting up at night going through the, you know, a 900 page document, you know, he's like promising the government will pay for IVF. So, um, you know, he just kind of, it's yeah. improv. All right, let's go with some questions. Uh, where's the, where, ah, great. Here we, here we come with mics. First of all, thank you for being here and thank you for the work you do. It's thank important you. and it matters. Thank you. Um, the second thing is Trump will not be here forever. What is, or who is the heir apparent? Or is this such a cult of personality that when it's not Trump, this the the MAGA movement can, will it survive Trump in some capacity and what does that look like? Um, I think it does su survive him, but it it will not have that sort of 
singular figure at the head of it that it has now. But you look at the United States Senate and, you know, the Josh Hawley's and the Ted Cruz's and the, I mean, those guys are going to be around for a while. Um, and I just don't know. I, I think about this so much. I mean, what replaces it? Um, you know, but whatever it is, it's, I think, unrecognizable for a lot of us, what we grew up with as Republican politics. And you, again, you look at the Senate and people like Mitt Romney are leaving. Um, and, you know, the Senate is just a very different place than it was. A lot of these uh, Republican governors, the same thing. I mean, there are a lot of other people out there who have sort of styled themselves like Trump. But none of them is going to, I think, going to be able to command the devotion that, that he has. Uh, you'd mentioned polling earlier before. Um, and, and again, in the, the previous election, it said Hillary was going to win by a landslide. So how can we trust what polls say now? May I say, though, like our poll at the Washington Post said she was going to win by two percentage points. She won the she won the popular vote by three percentage points. And the problem was that everybody was looking at the wrong things. Um, you know, and we've now had two elections just in this century alone where the popular vote's gone one way and the electoral college has gone the other. Um, so a lot of people are, you know, they're now they're now polling six states and who cares what the rest of them think. Although, I mean, people still do national polls. Um, and we were also spending a lot of money to correct some of the problems, like getting to people on their cell phones. Um, and you have to make so many more phone calls to just get your representative sample than you used to. But polling is broken. Um, and but I do think in these, if what if what you see is a whole bunch of polls of Pennsylvania that kind of say the same thing, they're probably right. Thank you for this evening. Sure. I'm curious, the last election, there was reported a lot of potential international interference. What we're not hearing as much, except for Trump's references to his famous strongmen. So I'm wondering, is, is is there something going on we're not hearing about? Is there still some bias and interference coming from other countries as to support Trump? Well, this just within the last week, um, we've seen some charges filed because, um, you know, the Russians were, in fact, spending a lot of money on cons conservative influencers. Um, I mean, they're they're still out there and they're still doing their stuff. And um, it's, you know, they're they're finding, I mean, the water always finds a way to get into the basement, you know. And so, and you have like, you know, we're, there's even people who are supposed to be under sanctions are, are nonetheless managing to get money into our election. What about the uh, House and the Senate? Uh, do you envision the possibility of Trump being president and the, those two uh, parts of our, the Congress being in the Democrats' hand, or what's that look like? Right now, I would not, and again, please take my predictions for what they're worth, but right now, I don't think the Democrats have a good shot at hanging on to the Senate. Um, you know, John Tester is suddenly showing some slippage in Montana. Uh, they have a fantasy that they can beat Ted Cruz in Texas. I'm a Texan. I don't think that happens. Um, you know, it's a 50-50 Senate right now, and they've got to run the table. And I just, and they're, they've got some really hard states that they need to win. Nevada's hard. Sherrod Brown's really a strong candidate, but Ohio is a very red state these days. West Virginia is gone. Um, so, you know, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Democrats get the house back. Yeah. 
when uh, Trump mentioned Arbonne the other day, uh, it motivated me to check into just how Arbonne stays in power. And I was reading about all the ways that he totally dominates the media over there so that people in Hungary have a, a totally distorted view of reality compared to the rest of the world. And it struck me that in this election, it's not just Trump versus Harris, it's Fox versus the Wall Street Journal and The Economist and the Washington Post and the New York Times and all the mainstream media that I grew up respecting and the reporters that I grew up viewing as heroes. Is there some way that we can get back to that time when we had the greater respect for the institutions that had really earned it over the years? You know, this is also something I worry about a lot. Um, the fact is people get their, their information in so many different silos these days. I mean, so many people, they get their information from crazy stuff that comes through on Facebook. Uh, the Washington Post's audience leans pretty hard left. Um, and it's it's just now there there are there aren't just three network newscasts at night that everybody's listening to. So I, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal still have huge, huge audiences, not just nationally, but globally. Um, but it's just, you know, young people get their news off TikTok. Um, so I, I don't know how, you know, we can put that back together. I mean, we are trying very hard to sort of be where our audience is, you know, and the fact that my company is owned by Jeff Bezos, you know, he came in 2013 and had this theory that he could sort of Amazonize the news, you know, just get it to into people's palm when they look at their phone or, or whatever. Um, and I do think that's the future, but I just don't think we're there yet. Uh, Ms. Tomasi, first of all, I subscribe to the Washington Post Thank online you. and I really appreciate the product that you all put out. I was wondering if, if just for fun or, or maybe not for fun, if you had any insight or a crystal ball as to what we might expect for an October surprise. This oh. Year. oh boy, I guess it wouldn't be a surprise, but um, <laughs> it, it, like I said, I just have now decided to suspend my belief that I can predict anything because like who would have thought Joe Biden would have come out on that debate stage is such a disaster. and. Who would have thought that, you know, Donald Trump would survive an assassination attempt by inches? And, you know, who would have thought that the party would have thrown a sitting president over and somehow coalesced the way they have behind Harris? So I just don't, there may be some external event, um, but, I, you know, I just don't, I mean, there's some pretty bad neighborhoods in the world these days. There could be a you know, some kind of disaster, but I can't imagine it's anything good. Go ahead. Oh, wait, we have, no, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that I feel like I learned so much from reading your thoughtful work and I oh, enjoyed the uh, opportunity to hear you speak. Um, I wonder if you might comment on our Senator from this very city, um, and over these many years, I always disagreed with him on policy, but now it seems to have become something different uh, from his point of view. And the fact that I feel like, and maybe it might not be true, that he could have stopped the Trump train and chose not to is very distressing. Yeah, Mitch McConnell, I mean, I think a lot of us thought after January 6th, that 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 was the ultimate rupture, but he is he is a party man, and he just says I'm going to support the nominee of of my party. He is, um, you know, he's giving up his leadership job after the election. God only knows what they replace him with. I mean, there's probably going to be a big fight within the Senate caucus between the sort of uh, you know the, the 
call them the three Johns, uh, Cornyn and versus some of the more kind of radicalized Republicans. It'll be interesting to see whose hands this ends up in. But yeah, in the end, McConnell just decided he was going to be a party guy. And the minute the minute Nikki Haley dropped out of that race, he endorsed Trump. Right, exactly. And it was, you know, it it was striking that in the end, and, and I also think he is, he's got his eye on the, on getting the Senate back. I think that matters more to him than just about anything else. And he's going to do whatever he thinks helps his candidates the most. But in his wife, well, and his wife, you know, quit the quit the Trump cabinet that day. Elaine Chow did. So. Hi. Uh, you mentioned the two instances that we've seen where the popular vote outweighed the electoral vote. And each time that's happened, we'd seen an increased push in repealing the electoral college in favor of, you know, a direct democracy approach with Hamilton and some of the others warning that a direct democracy would increase factionalism and populist rhetoric. What do you think the implications would be going forward if we did adopt such a um, a direct democracy approach of selecting the president? It's it's just not going to happen um, because just the the structural impediments to amending the Constitution are so so high. I mean, there are some states that are are playing around with how they run their elections. Um, I am a big fan of ranked choice voting which, um, you know, where you have five candidates and you don't just vote for one, you vote for your first, your second, your third, your fourth, your fifth, and the bottom ones drop out and they reassign those votes. And I think that's healthy because it requires all the candidates to think, well, maybe I'm not that guy's first choice, but I could be his second or third choice. And, you know, and it seems like that would be sort of a, a moderating influence. But, you know, there are a lot of other people who say, you know, they're rank choice is too complicated and you could there are scenarios under which some weird cat or dog gets into the final race um but i think it's working well where it's been tried and i do think that's part of it i mean it just feels like we structurally have to do something that fixes the primary system um, because the primaries just encourage people to be as extreme, extreme as they possibly can. And, you know, so few, and people blame it on gerrymandering, but that doesn't explain the Senate. You know, there are very few Senate races really in play too, and that's not gerrymandering. Um, I like to tell people, so I come from Texas, a state that has not elected a single Democrat to any statewide office since 1994. Now, what that means is that if you win the Republican primary, you're running for statewide office, that's it, the election's over. But in Texas, if you look at how few people actually vote in the Republican primary, it's like a million and a half out of a state of 29 to 30 million people. And the people who show up for the primary are they do come from the you know most extreme elements of the party so basically you can win pretty much any statewide election in texas a state of 29 to 30 million people with 750,000 votes and again the people who show up and and you see this texas is an extreme case but you see this everywhere um in house races they, they, when when i started covering congress you know where there were hundreds and hundreds of house seats that were in play as competitive. Not anymore. It's a handful. And the same is true of the Senate. Because I think the population has sort of sorted itself out into red and blue. I find either outcome to be pretty frightening. So I want some reassurance. Yeah. How do you think Trump and his supporters will handle losing? And how do you think Trump will move the country forward if he wins. Well, we've seen how Trump and his supporters handle losing. 
Um, I think that, okay, here's here are the various things that sort of scare me. We're, we're gonna have, because of the way voting works and the so many people vote early these days, that it takes a while to count the votes. And so you're gonna have what they refer to on election night as a red mirage, that the Republicans are going to probably do better on election night than they do over the next three or four days as the final votes get counted. So a lot of people are gonna say there's something nefarious going on here. Um, you know, and I just think if the margins are big, it's going to be hard for them to claim the election was rigged. But if you get down to a bunch of really tight races in a very few states, it's it could be a nightmare again. Hi, it's such a oh, I'm sorry. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And thank you to the Filson for bringing such a, you know, esteemed and wonderful um, speaker tonight. Um, my jaw dropped to the floor when Dick Cheney actually came out and endorsed um, Kamala Harris. Um, I expected Taylor Swift uh, to do that. So, well, and I was, childless cat lady. and I know, and I, and her cat looks exactly like mine. And I was proud that um, she did that. Um, so my first question is, how much do these endorsements really make an impact? I mean, they sound good and, you know, but how much do they really sway someone? My second question is, um, there's not much I can do in Kentucky as far as the presidential ticket for my preference for, of candidate, but I feel passionate that my candidate wins. Um, what can I do in this state to somehow impact those six or seven states that are going to make the decision? Well, I'm sure they're happy to take your money. Um, Besides, and, but I actually like, um, I live in Maryland and I had friends who went up and knocked on doors in Pennsylvania for the Fetterman race. Um, and, you know, but it, it is just a sort of feels like a terrible situation where the rest of us are just bystanders. Um, you know, and again, going back to Reagan, I mean, can you imagine a situation where anybody could win 49 states in America today? And as far as these endorsements, I think they matter at the margins. I mean, I think the Democrats got really excited about Dick Cheney and I have no idea what Swifties are gonna do. But I, I generally don't think they matter a lot. I can tell you the one that is being sort of in the in the water being rumored uh, is what's Mitt Romney gonna do? But, you know, George W. Bush has made it very clear he's not getting off the bench. Um, and I'm not even sure that would help because so many, so much of the Trump base just hates everything about that is attached to the name Bush. So I just don't know who really makes a difference. I have a media question. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to hear your reaction to the criticism that, um, which I assume you've heard, that the mainstream media sane washes uh, almost everything Trump says. So I just- like Sane washing is acting as though it's normal. And that is such a cool phrase. Who right. came up with that? You know. um, I've got, well, I've got to tell you, so I, I feel like, you know, this guy has a very decent chance of actually getting elected. And I think it is our responsibility to treat it as though, you know, to, to look at what he says policy wise. I mean, we point out when he doesn't tell the truth. But if he is proposing something, you know, I think we need to take it seriously. Yeah. 
yeah, I just, and I don't think we do that. Um, you know, I, it, the problem is, you know, what we write doesn't matter at all to the people who are in favor of him. It isn't like, you know, but I do think, like I said, what happens on the other side is I get, I get from Democrats, why do you even cover him? And then, then I'll get the next email will be, why aren't you pointing out that he said something crazy yesterday? And it's, it's just been a really, um, it's, it's just a hard situation for us to handle. I, I, you know, I, my, how I knew the Trump president, and that was the other thing, when Trump got elected in 2016, I think there was a reasonable belief that the office was going to change him, that, you know, he was going to have to function. And, you know, it turned out it didn't. And I remember it was about five days into his presidency. I get up really, really early. And so I was making my early coffee. It was probably like 6 a.m. And my cell phone's sitting on the counter next to me and it starts going, you know? And it turned out that it was an all newsroom alert going out across the entire Washington Post newsroom. And all it said was, he's awake and he's tweeting. You know, and so, um, I, I do fault though, I do think that we, if anything, we cover everything he says so much that people have trouble figuring out what they should worry about and what yeah. they shouldn't. I mean, we do sort of swing at everything he throws across the plate and we probably shouldn't. Uh, Karen, thanks very much for all your good work. Thanks. And I appreciate you being here. I had a question about um, Biden's condition. And <clears throat> I think a lot of Americans were shocked when that debate took place. And so my question is, do you think the mainstream media, meaning the New York Times, the Washington Post, et cetera, did enough to investigate, to reveal, to analyze that, uh, that Biden's decline? I think that especially the White House reporters who were seeing him every day uh, didn't. And there was a, but what would happen is anytime anybody would point something out, like about two weeks before the debate, Annie Linsky of the Wall Street Journal does a piece saying, Biden is showing a market decline in private meetings. I don't know if you remember this Wall Street Journal piece. First of all, no Democrat would go on the record about this. So the only names she had in the story were Republicans. She got her head ripped off. You know, they were denouncing her on MSNBC, how irresponsible this was. Um, but I do think... I think there are going to be some people and I think some people around Biden who are going to have a lot to answer to for history for, because how could that have been what, what we all saw just a complete aberration that night. And it should go back to his decision to decide to run for a second term. Because let the Democrats have a phenomenal bench. I mean, you just look at some of these governors, your governor, um, Roy Cooper of North Carolina, Gretchen Whitmer, um, Josh Shapiro, <laughs> Kamala Harris, the new and improved Kamala Harris. I mean, if there had been an actual primary where all of these people could have been tested, I think it could have been a situation like the Obama-Hillary Clinton primary of 2008. That thing went on forever. But when Obama finally won it, he had come out a much better candidate than he had started out as. And I think it probably, you know, in retrospect, would have been healthy for the Democratic Party to have gone through a really rough, vigorous primary. Hello. 
Like many people, I have been concerned about the Electoral College. I don't see any way to fix it. But there are two states in this country that have uh, proportional representation insofar as electors casting their votes. Nebraska and Maine, Maine. I think. Yeah. Yes. Is there any talk in Washington about um, encouraging states to do this for the future? which would go a long way to correct that imbalance. I, I like that too. Although, believe it or not, I have seen scenarios, you know, because everybody does those little games where you play the electors. And I have seen scenarios where the entire election could come down to Omaha. Um, <laughs> because Nebraska does apportion its electoral votes according to congressional districts. This, and Maine does the same thing. And I, I too, I think that is healthy. I mean, you look at a place like California, you know, it, it's like, it doesn't make any difference if you win California by one vote or by 7 million votes, you're still gonna get the exact same number of electors out of it. And it just, to me, that just doesn't make any sense. And it is one of the reasons I think that we've had two elections this century where one result goes one way and the other goes the other. It's just, it's just not healthy. Not really, um, you know, and I, I wish I knew more why Maine and uh, what the, what brought them to the, yeah, I, you know, I'm gonna go do that, thank you. But yeah, so keep an eye on Omaha. You had mentioned earlier about the young people getting their news through TikTok and in the media, the traditional media, keeping an eye on the people that may influence the way TikTok is for them. You mean the Chinese? Um, yeah, and you know, we are also, we have people then who get our stuff on TikTok. Uh, but it's just kind of nutty stuff gets out that way. Um, it's like the, in this whole thing on um, on the Haitians who supposedly in Springfield, Ohio are eating kittens and geese, all of this traces to one Facebook rant. Um, you know, and how, how do you police this? I don't know. But it, it was like, there was a Springfield community Facebook page that somebody said, well, I hear from somebody who else who hears who has somebody and, you know, all of a sudden they are just off to the races. Going back to your comment of that would be a good uh, 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 article. Do you have free reign in choosing uh, what you write about? And can you explain a little bit the process that you go through in deciding you know, what topic I'm going to choose on this particular day? Uh, yeah, how do, how do I, yeah, they are very, uh, and because I'm sort of a senior person, they, they'll usually accept my judgment of what I'm kind of interested in. But I, I get so worn down by the, the horse race that I will try and do things. Like just this week, I did a column on the fact that um, they just the FDA has just approved a new blood test that can detect colon cancer, and it is something that you know young people are dying of colon cancer in numbers that had never been the case before. The minute the FDA approves it, social uh, Medicare has to cover it, but insurance companies don't have to cover it unless it until it gets rated by this tiny little panel of 16 volunteer experts that you have never probably heard of called the United States Preventive Services Task Force. And it is gonna be five to 10 years before they make a, you know, before they give this thing a grade. And to me, that just seems sort of nuts that, you know, Medicare has to cover the cost of it right away, but in the meantime, people who need this the most are going to be dying of it because this tiny little agency doesn't get any money. And so, you know, it it 
it does make me feel that occasionally I've sort of got to get out of, I, last year I did a big long piece on, um, we have a brand new auxiliary Catholic Bishop in, in Washington and nobody had really paid much attention to his, when the Pope named him, but somebody had said, do you know he came to this country illegally? This guy is a, he was an immigrant. He fled the civil war in Salvador in the early 1990s. He literally came to this country after being deported twice, came to this country in the trunk of a car. And he is now an auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of Washington. And it is the most remarkable immigrant story. And it just gives me so much joy to be able to go out and find something like that to write about. We all know what happened in 20. Trump has already said he wants to be a dictator. He's already said that if he loses, there will be a bloodbath. What do we do? Um, well, I can tell you because I've you know spent time in Wilmington at the headquarters, and there are already a bunch of very, very frivolous lawsuits that are being filed in a lot of states. And the Democrats are doing their very best to sort of fight lawyers with lawyers. Um, and, you know, it is really going to come down to who is running the machinery in individual states. And, you know, you look at, and in so many places, the Republican state party has been taken over by really radical, extreme figures. And I don't know what we do. Um, although it, you know, it's, it, I think it's a good thing that a lot of the people who had, you know, who were responsible for some of the worst shenanigans in 2020 have since faced criminal charges for it. And I guess that is probably the, you know, the biggest deterrent you can get right now. But no, it's, you see all of the same ingredients out there. We've and on that more. note, oh, oh. If we could just shift gears a little bit sure. and talk about the Supreme Court. Do we really have a witch hunt going on or do we really have some severe ethical breaches among our justices? I, I, I am astonished that, that, that they don't have to live under any ethical code because the rest of the judiciary does. Um, and certainly the, you know, the pressure is there, but the, they're, they're so insulated from the pressure that I, you know, I think all we can do is just keep pointing out these instances where, you know, just all kinds of obvious ethical breaches are happening involving their spouses or whatever. Karen, thank you so oh, much. Yeah.